with no further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, we have on here David Kyle Johnson, Dr. David Kyle Johnson, just Kyle to us. It, probably our most popular speaker and our most loyal speaker. And my favorite speaker. <laughs> Uh, I, I do miss the Christmas orgy discussions, but other than that, you know, every topic is always interesting, and I'm sure today's going to be just as well. Uh, he, David's a, or Kyle's a professor of philosophy at King's College, and he asked me to point out he's also the executive director of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is a long title, and I'm sure that makes it very important. And his topic today is why I am an atheist. So we should all be able to relate to that. Kyle? I'll turn the, turn the stage over to you. Thank you so much. One, two. Check. There you go. Good. All right. There we go. Um, how many of you is this the first time you've been together here since the pandemic? Just a couple? Okay, good. All right. Good. I thought it might be like everybody. Like This is the first time that we've got to get together. Okay, so... Um, I think I talked about uh, Black Mirror last time, right? But that was the online discussion, right? Well, that was in 2020, right? Um, so it was the last time that I was here was uh, talking about Black Mirror. Um, around that time, I was working on this. So what I'm going to present to you is going to be a little bit different today um, because I'm going to read a paper rather than doing my, my kind of normal, just go through a PowerPoint and discuss a little bit, although we will have some of that at the end. Uh, the reason I'm going to do that is because this paper I'm going to read to you, I've, I've really crafted very finely, and I kind of covered everything in the right order and, and wording it just right and that kind of stuff. Uh, what it is, is um, Roman Litfield is putting out a philosophy of religion handbook, and the editor, Mark Lampert, um, decided at the end of the book. So philosophy of religion handbook is usually big wigs in philosophy of religion writing pretty long uh, detailed academic papers uh, about where things currently stand in an academic field, right? And so in philosophy of religion, what are people saying about this argument, and that argument, this issue, religious language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, that's the bulk of the book. But he decided at the end to have, I think, six chapters that were a little bit less formal academic, more for kind of common reading. They were also shorter that were why I am an X. And so there's a why I'm a Muslim chapter, there's a why am I a Christian chapter, there's a why I'm an agnostic chapter, and then there's a why am I an atheist chapter. And uh, went to the head of my department, uh, and he recommended me, and so I got to write the why am I an atheist chapter for this philosophy of religion handbook. All right. Uh, so I only had 4,000 words. Um, I guess actually it was told to be between... I couldn't go over 42, and that's what it is. It's exactly 4,200 words. Um, so... Um, uh, so I crafted that, and that is actually being published. I actually talked to the editor yesterday, and he said it is printed and being shipped out. My battery's dead. That's How what's going that? on. Can you hear this? It's, it's down. Like the battery here shows that it is blank. Well, he's back. So I think it's just I'm starting it up, and then it's and then it's dying on me. <laughs> I can just hold that. You have batteries, or I can, I can hold. Yeah. I'm going to uh, read the paper for you. I do have a PowerPoint to go with it that's got some good pictures and some lines to go with it. It should be pretty easy to follow along because a lot of it will be on the screen. Uh, but that's the plan. And then after I'm done, I'll open it up for Q&A. That's what I'll start roaming around and, and having a discussion with you guys. All right. So um, I'm also getting older, so I'm going to have to take off my glasses to do this. Um, all right. So why I'm an atheist. Um, and let's, uh, there we go. All right. So it would be impossible in this limited venue, start out with a little author's note here. It would be impossible in this limited venue generously afforded to me to fully articulate all the reasons I'm an atheist. Thus, many of the arguments below are far too brief. Fortunately, I've articulated most of them in greater detail in other publications. Consequently, I will be extensively referencing my own work. I hope this does not appear vain. I am greatly indebted to the work of other philosophers. Uh, the problem is, is that if I had cited all of them, my entire word count would have been taken up by all the citations. So the relevant list of their publications can be found in the cumulative references of my other papers, which there'll be a list of that in the end. Okay, so what is an atheist? Why is it not, there we go. An atheist claims to know that no gods exist. They don't just say, I'm not sure, or I don't take a position on the topic like the agnostic might. And while they will say, I don't believe God's exists, an atheist rejection is more active. 
they know gods don't exist. The honest atheist will admit that they cannot 100% prove that no gods exist, but that is no different from admitting that one cannot 100% prove that they are not dreaming right now. Indeed, not even in science is anything ever 100% proven, but 100% proof is not necessary for knowledge. As an atheist, as an atheist, I am as certain that no gods exist as I am that the world is round and that I am not dreaming right now. In a way, this makes me barely different than the typical theist. Thousands of gods have been worshipped over the centuries, from Anuit to Zeus, and theists don't believe in them either. I simply reject the existence of one more god than the theist does. So, for simplicity, I'm going to primarily restrict my comments to explaining why I reject the existence of the deity theists typically embrace the Judeo-Christian Muslim deity that is also known as God with a capital G, right? I usually take that to be God's name. That's why it's capitalized. So that's what I'll restrict myself to. And that is that then that is the God that they believe is perfect in all respects, all knowing, all powerful and morally perfect. Right? Simply put, so we're on to uh, slide three here. Simply put, I do uh, not believe in God because to do so is irrational. And it is irrational because one, the concept of God is logically incoherent. Two, the idea that God exists was fabricated. Three, the arguments for God's existence fail. And four, the arguments against God's existence succeed. And what follows, I will briefly elucidate each point. Afterward, in reply to possible objections, I will explain five, why belief in God cannot be rational without evidence, and six, why one should not choose to believe in God despite the fact that it is irrational. Some people make that argument. Yeah, it is irrational, but we should believe anyway. I'll refute that as well. So I'm gonna go through basically each one of these things in turn. Um, okay, so one, the concept of God is logically incoherent. Oops, no. There are no circles with four sides. I can know this with 100% certainty because it is true by definition, right? In the same way, I can know that God, proper G, right, capital God, does not exist. Capital G, God, does not exist. The properties that God would have to have if he existed are logically inconsistent. So the concept of God is logically incoherent. For example, if God exists, he is both all powerful and morally perfect. If a being is all possible, if, if a being is all powerful, it is possible for that being to do anything. But if he is morally perfect, it is impossible for him to do evil actions. It cannot be both possible and impossible for some being to do evil actions, and thus God cannot exist. Now, in reply to this kind of classic problem, one might note that philosophers generally agree that God being all powerful does not entail that he can do what is logically impossible. So we can't make squared circles, that kind of stuff. So God being unable to do evil does not entail that he is not all powerful. A morally perfect being can do evil. That statement, a morally perfect being can do evil, is just as logically impossible as there is a squared circle. So it's not supposed to be a big deal if God can't make this true. But this this argument, this reply to this argument that I've made here has two flaws. First, it misses the point. It is logically impossible for an all good being to do evil. That's true. But that is what must be possible if an all good, all powerful being exists. An all powerful being must at least have the abilities to do what I can do, and I can be evil, I assure you. Second, if it is not possible for God to do evil, then he cannot freely choose between doing good and evil. Am I on the right here? Right. So if it is not possible for God to do evil, then he cannot freely choose between doing good and evil. To freely choose between two things, choosing either must be possible. But if God's choices to do good are not free, then they are not morally, praise, morally praiseworthy. This is what Augustine taught us, right? That only free actions are morally praiseworthy. And if God's actions are not morally praiseworthy, then he's not morally perfect. Indeed, from this, it follows that moral perfection itself is logically impossible, right? So if, if I clarify that, right? 
if you're morally perfect, that means that you can't do evil. But if you can't do evil, well, then you can't do otherwise. If you can't do otherwise, you can't do it freely. And if you can't do it freely, well, then you don't get moral credit for it. Well, then you're not all good in the first place, right? So if you are all good, well, you can't be all good. And so the actual concept of moral perfection is logically impossible. It's logically contradictory. Right. Good. So, and thus, and if that's true, thus God. So, if God's morally perfect by definition, moral perfection is impossible. Well, then God can't exist. There can't be a morally perfect being. And it will not do to solve this problem or any such problem by appealing to mystery, saying something like, "Well, God's just bigger than us, so we can't understand how He has contradictory properties." This is an ad hoc excuse that makes theism unfals unfalsifiable, and thus makes theism fundamentally irrational. So. While the non-existence of other deities is just beyond a reasonable doubt, we can be certain that God, by the classic definition, perfect being, doesn't exist. Ironically, before Augustine and Origen and a few others, God was not considered perfect by theists. So in a way, by adding perfection to God's description, to their deity's description, which they did because of influence from Plato and that kind of stuff, but by adding perfection to God's description, theists essentially defined their deity out of existence. It would have been better to stick with the non-perfect version. At least that's just, you know, uh, so unrational for other reasons, but it's not logically incoherent. But this brings us to the next reason that I reject God's existence. The idea that God exists was fabricated. It is generally accepted that ancient humans invented deities for various reasons. To explain floods, the seasons, or squelch their fears of death. Uh, Kevin and I actually covered this. Uh, Kevin's one of my students back here. Uh, we covered this in our philosophy of religion class uh, and with Neil, a, Neil, Neil Manson's book or whatever, and went into a lot more detail than I was aware of even before we, we read the book about the different competing explanations and that kind of stuff. We actually concluded we think they're all compatible. There's probably a little bit of each theory going on in explaining how religion and belief in God came about. Uh, but the, the point remains is that we have a pretty good idea that belief in God was something that we generated, that humans generated, right? It wasn't something that came down from above. Uh, the origins of God's perfection, the idea that God is perfect is even better understood. In the Timaeus, Plato introduced the Demiurge, a perfect transcendental being that organized the world according to the forms. And later Augustine and Origen incorporated Plato's concept of their understanding of God, into, into their understanding of God. That's a big simplistic, of course. Uh, you can read uh, Karen Armstrong's A History of God, really good book on the history of where this idea comes from. And she's a, she's a theist, like she's not like a uh, you know, non-religious scholar or whatever, she's admitting this is where we got our idea of God from and it didn't come from God. What's important is we know that God is a human invention. No person's belief in God or that he has certain properties causally traces back to God. God didn't cause it. This alone is sufficient justification for the belief that God doesn't exist. So once we know that it's something that we fabricated, it's an idea that we fabricated, that alone is reason to think, well, then God like, very likely doesn't exist, right, if we, invent, if we invented it, right? Now, to that argument, it's common to claim that that argument I just made commits what's called the genetic fallacy. Am I on the right? Uh, yeah, good. The, and the genetic fallacy essentially suggests something like the origins of an idea are irrelevant to its truth. You can't, you can't tell me where an idea comes from to refute it. But as I explained in the 2014 paper, this fallacy is widely misunderstood. The origins of an idea are not a good reason to dismiss evidence of its truth. That's true, right? So the ring structure of benzene came to Frederick Kluge in a dream. Uh, that is not a good reason to dismiss the subsequent evidence that we got that demonstrated that his ring structure benzene idea was right. But without evidence, the fact that idea only originated in a dream would provide reason enough to doubt it. It's like before the evidence came in, if the only reason we had to think that benzene was ring structured was his dream, well, that is a good reason to think that it's false. But that's not a good reason to believe it, right? You can't dismiss the evidence of something based on its origin, but if you know that the origin does not originate the thing itself, that is good reason. Moreover, Realizing that the notion of some, that something exists specifically, so not just like an idea that, that benzene's ring structured, but realizing the notion that something exists does not originate in the actual existence of that thing is especially good reason to conclude that that thing does not exist. For example, learning that belief in the chupacabra traces back to Madeline Totolino's conflating reality with the movie Species. She basically saw the movie Species and conflated some stuff in her memory and thought she saw it out in the real world. 
That is good reason to believe that Chupacabra doesn't exist. Is it 100% proof? No, but it's pretty stinking close, right? Likewise, learning that belief in God and his perfections originates from ignorance of natural phenomena or other psychological factors. And Plato's demiurge is reason enough to doubt God's existence. Of course, that is not reason to dismiss evidence that God exists, but as we shall now see, that evidence that's always presented is faulty. The arguments for God's existence. Yeah. So, for evidence of God's existence, some will cite stories about miracles or demon possession, right? If miracles occur or demons exist, then God must be real, so, so the argument goes. But not only could miracles and demons be real without God existing, justified belief in such things is impossible. As I explained in 2015 and 2017, neither divine nor demonic activity can ever be the best explanation for anything. We know what best explanations require. Demonic and miracle explanations kind of like by their very nature lack the proper, the proper properties that good explanations have to have. And so they can't be ever the best explanation for anything. So for evidence of God's existence, academic theists usually cite, sorry, so for evidence of, of, of God's existence, academics usually cite two arguments, the Kalam cosmological argument and the fine-tuning teleological arguments. Despite their reputation, however, both spectacularly fail. All right, now I'm gonna go, there's gonna be a lot here that's coming at you here. Um, if you have questions about this, I'll talk about it more in the Q&A session. I have a whole paper I wrote for Think that talks about these two particular things. So if we wanna go over that detail, we can. But here we go, the Kalam cosmological argument, all right? It was developed by Muslim theologians who belong to various schools of Il al Kalam, the science of discourse. And they, they actually thought that the arguments of the Falasifa, a, com a competing Muslim sect inspired by Greek philosophy or falsafa, they thought their arguments for God were faulty. The Falasifa theistic argument suggested that all material things depended on a, the existence of a necessary entity. Even if that's true, the 11th century Kalam scholar Al-Ghazali rightly observed, we have to have a necessary entity. Well, why couldn't that entity just be the universe itself? So that he, even he realized that argument doesn't work. That argument to a necessary being doesn't work. Even if there has to be a necessary being, well, that just could just be the universe, right? Similar worries arise about Aquinas' uncaused cause or unmoved mover and un self-necessitating necessitator arguments. So Anselm's or, or excuse me, Aquinas' first three arguments. So the Kalam cosmological argument purports to answer that question. If there has to be a necessary entity, why couldn't it just be the universe? It proposes to answer that question. So it says, unlike the universe, God didn't begin to exist. The universe did. Things that begin to exist, like the, like, like, uh, whoops. Thanks for numbering my papers. My, my, saved my life there. Okay, thanks for numbering my papers. Um, things that begin to exist, like chairs, people, and universes need a cause things that didn't begin to exist, like God, don't need a cause. That's the argument, right? So things begin to exist, need a cause. Things that don't, don't. God, if he exists, doesn't exist. Universe does. It needs a cause. God does it. That's why God could be the, the necessary object and the universe couldn't. Okay. Now, that's the argument. Now, as I pointed out in my think piece, does God exist? As it stands, the Kalam cosmological argument equivocates, right? Chairs and people don't begin to exist like the universe they come into existence when already existing matter is arranged in certain kinds of ways, right? The universe began, so let me elaborate on that just really quickly, right? So if you think about, I used an action figure in my office as an example with Kevin the other day, right? You think about the action figure that's sitting on my, uh, you know, Doctor Who action figure that's sitting on my shelf in my office or whatever, that thing began to exist, but when it began to exist, it began to exist because matter that already existed came to be configured in a certain kind of way. Right? Or think about like a Lego house or something like that. Right, The Legos are already there. It does, the thing doesn't exist until you put it together. And then when you do it, put it together, now it exists. Right, But that's normal objects come into existence when things are put together in a certain kind of way. Right, uh, My son Johnny and I put together a Lego Millennium Falcon that had 8,000 pieces. That thing didn't exist. And it took five months, more like nine months, I guess. It took a long time to put that single thing together. Now it exists, but only because we put the parts that already existed together. Right, The universe didn't come to be formed out of already existing matter. The beginning of the universe is matter itself coming into existence, right? Is that making sense? So the universe began when matter itself came into existence. So in order to establish that the universe, so let me, let me go back. So 
if, if you're just saying when things come into existence, they need a cause, oh, the universe came into existence. Up here, you're talking about matter arrangement, putting things together. Down here, you're talking about matter coming into existence. So your argument's equivocating. It's talking about two different things and two different premises under the same guise, come into existence, but come into existence means two totally different things. And so the argument doesn't work. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it equivocates. My favorite example of argument that equivocates is baloney's better than nothing and nothing's better than prime rib. Therefore, baloney's better than prime rib. You guys get it, right? Like the nothing means something different in the two premises, right? And it, it looks like it's valid, right? But it's not because the argument equivocates. The same problems going on here, right? comes into existence means two different things in the two different premises. Now, you can correct that by making them the same. So here, in order to establish that the universe needs a cause, you would need to establish that the event of matter coming into existence needs a cause. So you could change that to your, per, your first premise. When matter comes into existence, it needs a cause. That could be your new first premise. But since the universe composes all the matter that exists, saying the event of matter coming into existence need, it needs a cause, just is saying the universe needs a cause. Thus, the arguments either equivocates, or if you correct the equivocation, it just argues in a circle. But it doesn't work. Make sense? Right? The other argument is the fine-tuning argument. The fine-tuning argument suggests the complexity of the universe entails God's existence, because the values of certain constants seem to be balanced on a razor's edge for life. So for example, if the mass of neutrinos had been uh, five times 10 to the negative fourth, 34th kilogram, instead of five times 10 to the negative 35th kilograms, and in the printed version of this, I actually switched those numbers, I messed up a little bit, but this is, this is I double checked, this is the correct one. So if the, if the mass of neutrinos had been five times 10 to the negative 34th kilograms instead of to the negative 35th kilograms, the early universe would have collapsed due to the extra mass, and that would make life impossible. That can't just be dumb luck, the argument goes, God must have done it. That's the art. That's, that, that's the fine tuning argument. However, in my think piece, uh, Does God Exist? I explain the five major problems with this argument. And again, we can go over these in detail later if you want to. One, the universe is fine tuned for galaxy formation, it's actually hostile towards life. Two, there's no reason for thinking that the constants actually could be different than they are. And even if they could, most of them would balance out due to conservation. So you couldn't get these kind of results. Uh, for example, the mass of neutrinos is dictated by their number. So if they were heavier, there'd be fewer of them and their total mass would be the same and the universe would expand in the same kind of way. Three, our universe's constants are not the only ones conducive to life. There's actually many. Uh, there's something I call the only one way to make a square fallacy involved here. Four, the probabilities of the argument that it expresses are either meaningless, they say things like it's a one in infinity chance and that's a meaningless probability, or they're completely arbitrary, and so they're useless. And then five, the argument uses misleadings of measurements to make the constant's value seem more remarkable than they are. For example, it measures the mass of neutrinos in kilograms. Kilograms is what you use to use, you know, measure the mass of a person there are trillions of neutrinos passing through your thumbnail right now, right? Like it is a completely disproportionate unit of measure when you measure in kilograms. Oh, it looks remarkable. It's not actually that remarkable. Yes, that's something else that by, by using that level of measurement, you kind of get lost. It's, oh, it's 34 versus 35. Aren't we exactly? It's like, it's 10 times greater. Um, it's, this is actually, since you mentioned this, is actually worth mentioning. So uh, Manson points this out. We talk about this in philosophy religion class, that this would be like, this would be like arguing that Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan's height is one times 10 to the negative 16th light year. And if it was 17 or if it was 15, he'd be too tall or too short to play basketball. He must be the one and only height that's required to play basketball, right? And it's like, uh, no, if one times, 10, one times 10 to the negative 16th or whatever, it, one, one times whatever it is, it's like, that's six, six, right? If it's a 17, he's like 13 inches tall. Right, and if it's, if, it's, if it's the other way, he's like 83 feet tall, right? Like that doesn't mean like there's such a wide variation here. That doesn't mean that 6'6 six, six is the only possible. Like there could be quite a bit of variation if you measure it proportionally, right? That's exactly what's going on here, right? Um, it's because they measured it in kilograms that you can make these minor adjustments. It's like, oh, if it was greater, the whole universe would be different. Like, yeah, it's 10 times greater, right? Making sense? Right. So the failure of these arguments is significant, not only because they are widely regarded to be better than all the other arguments, but because their failure provides justifying reason to doubt God's existence. When it comes to existential matters, whether something exists, 
the, an absence of evidence is evidence of absence because the burden of proof on any existential matter is always on the believer. If you want to believe that Bigfoot exists, it's not my job to prove that he does until I do, uh, until I, until I do, I'm not justified in believing he does. And you are not justified in believing he doesn't, or the same thing would apply for ghosts, right? Like it's not your job to prove that ghosts don't exist. If I want to believe in it, it's my job to prove that they do. Right. Contrary to claims of apologists, it is never the skeptic's job to prove that something does not exist. Indeed, unless it's the proverbial square circle, such an, is, is, is an impossible task. You can't prove uh, such things don't exist uh, unless they could like a logical contradiction. One can, however, provide sufficient evidence that God does not exist. And that brings us to the fourth reason I'm an atheist, problem of evil. The arguments against God's existence succeed. The most serious versions of the most powerful argument against God's existence, the problem of evil, are the logical problem of natural evil and the evidential problem of moral evil. Let's talk about the former first. So, the logical problem of natural evil. As I explained in 2011 and 2013, to solve the logical problem of natural evil, one must explain how an all-powerful, all-knowing, morally perfect being embedded physical laws into the universe that necessitate things like earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, that kind of stuff. How that statement is not logically incoherent. How could a perfect being embed laws that necessitate earthquakes, right? If I embedded puppy killing machines into the walls of my new house and made my little puppies live in my house, right? I could not be said to be a loving master of my puppies. Even if they were always lucky and weren't around when the machines were active, right? Um, I would still not be able to be a loving uh, 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 master of my puppies. Same way, God makes a live on the earth, but he embeds human killing machines in it. Doesn't seem to be all loving. And the theist cannot claim that it is logically impossible to create a world without laws that necessitate, necessitate such things. The Garden of Eden and heaven are both examples in their own you know, line of thinking that are at least logically possible counterexamples here, right? Apart from rejecting the theistic claim that God created our universe by thinking that we're like, we live in a computer simulation or something like that, this problem really has no solution. And most theists are not gonna be on board with saying that we live in a computer simulation. Get too far behind? Okay, yeah, good. All right, that was the last thing I said, all right. Ready to go? The evidential problem of moral evil suggests that every instance of needless suffering caused by humans that God could have prevented serves as evidence that God doesn't exist. Now, skeptical theists claim this argument is flawed because God could have a reason, could have reasons for allowing such evils that we simply can't understand, and thus evil cannot serve as evidence against God's existence. But as I explained in 2013 and 2017, skeptical theism is mathematically and probabilistically unsound. Uh, as an example, if I hear a story about a baby drowning, drowning, excuse me, after being left alone in a pool, I am justified in believing that no lifeguard was on duty. And this is true, even though it's possible that some unbeknownst to me circumstance kept an attending lifeguard from performing their duty, right? That's possible, but I'm justified in believing there wasn't a lifeguard on duty, right? Likewise, if an evil that God would have prevented occurs, the probability that he does not exist raises, even if he could have reasons I don't understand for allowing it. I want to talk about the math and that kind of stuff or give some other examples. We can do that a little bit later. So such evils raise the probability that no one willing and capable, capable to prevent those events exists. All right? The other response to the moral problem is the free will solution. God allows things like the Holocaust to happen because allowing us to make our own free will decisions is more important than eliminating evil. Okay. But in 2021, I explained that while this solution does in fact work, it only works at the cost of rejecting two defining features of traditional theism, divine providence and petitionary prayer. If free will is so important that God cannot even violate Hitler's free will indirectly by giving him a heart attack to stop the Holocaust, then God must have to maintain a complete non-interference policy when it comes to free will. Protecting free will must be that important. If so, God has no control over how the world turns out, because we determine how it turns out by our free will, and he cannot answer most prayers, because most prayers require God to interfere with someone's, like, please God, give me this job. Please God, let that parking spot be open. Please God, let you know so-and-so win the presidential election. All of those require God to interfere with free will decisions. Right. So indeed, 
if this is true on this solution that God interfered, that doesn't ever interferes with free will, the universe would be no different with or without God's existence. So the evidence is in the definition of God is logically incoherent. God is a fabricated concept. The arguments for God fail and the arguments against God succeed. Each of these facts by itself is enough to know that God does not exist. Some, however, have incorrectly argued that belief in God can still be rational despite all this. It cannot. So belief in God without evidence is irrational. The most famous attempt to show that belief in God is rational is Pascal's wager. There we go. Uh, reason, he said, can decide nothing on religious matters, but by believing you have nothing to lose and everything to gain, like heaven. And since it's rational to make the better bet, belief in God is, is rational. You've probably heard something like this before, right? So again, he says, reason can decide nothing on religious matters, but since believing God's the better bet, it's rational to take the better bet. Belief in God can be rational. As I explained in 2016, however, Pascal's argument is deeply flawed. First, belief in God is not without risk. So it's not necessarily the better bet. You could be punished eternally for belonging to the wrong religion, right? Or you could waste the only life that you have trying to please a non-existent deity, which if it's the only life you have, that's a pretty high cost, right? Second, as we saw above, Pascal was wrong that reason can decide nothing on religious matters, as I've shown, right? Arguments and, and problem of evil and all that kind of stuff. It looks like reason can actually reveal that. But even if he was right that re reason can reveal nothing about religious matters, his argument still fails. Why? If reason cannot decide religious matters, we cannot know that God will reward theistic belief. We don't know if he wants us to believe him in Iran, right? And you can't just say, well, of course he doesn't. No, reason, de reason declares that. We can't even know. It would be just as likely that God would rather spend eternity with people who proportion their belief to the evidence, not those who blindly believe, right? So in other words, like I, I remember, I think it was uh, Carl Sagan who made this point. Now, maybe somebody made the point about Carl Sagan. But the argument essentially was like, so if you were God and but you thought you had to hide yourself, right? Who, who would you want to spend eternity with, right? Carl Sagan or Pat Robertson? <laughs> Right, somebody who is, is judicious in the way that they believe, who is intelligent, who thinks, and that kind of stuff, or someone who just credibly believes whatever you, you, they, you know, they think that you want them to believe or whatever. Right? You see, see the problem here, right? Like, God may actually not want, if he exists, he may not want us to believe if he has, has to hide himself. He'd rather spend eternity with people who are thinking individuals. Uh, perhaps that is why he hides himself. Thus, we cannot know that theistic belief actually is the better bet. The most philosophical, so that's the most, Pascal's the most popular version of this. The most philosophically sophisticated defense of belief in God without evidence belongs to Alvin Plantinga. There's Alvin Plantinga. He suggests he was at Notre Dame for a very, very long time. I went to his retirement celebration, actually. Uh, when he, he suggests that when we justifiably believe a tree is before us, we believe without evidence because our experience of the tree is non-propositional. And evidence always comes in propositional form. So I just like my experience is not a proposition. My experience generates my belief in the tree. And I'm justified in believing the tree, even though no, no propositions support that belief. He calls such beliefs properly basic. Belief in God can also be properly basic, planning argues, because God can cause us to see him the same kind of way that we can experience a tree. And we, he does this via, God does this via religious experience and a sixth spiritual sense that is called the sensus divinitatis. Sensus divinitatis, it's Latin. Sensus divinitatis. Uh, he's borrowing the phrase from, I forget who, the, where, where the sensus divinitatis, I think it might be, I think it might be Aquinas, but I'm not sure. Uh, indeed, such an experience can be so powerful that it outweighs any evidence to the contrary. So through this sixth census, the Venetatis, we can experience God, and this experience can be so overwhelming that can even overwhelm evidence to the contrary, planning argues. And thus, belief can be justified, even if it's not based on evidence, because it's based on this kind of experience. What are this argument's faults? Faults? Well, first, as planning admits, this argument only shows that belief in God could possibly be true, or excuse me, could possibly, if true, be justified. So if God existed, then belief in him could be justified, but it doesn't actually show that belief in God is justified. It's like this conditional, like it shows this conditional statement to be true, right? Not that it actually is justified, but that if it was true, it could be justified, all right? Second, not even our regular senses are reliable enough to override good evidence. Growing recognition of this is why courtrooms are relying less and less on eyewitness testimony. In my critical thinking classes, we go on and on about how our senses lead us astray far more often than we realize. So how much less justification 
must the experiences of a sixth sense, which we cannot corroborate and even don't even know exists, confer. It's not going to be able to weigh out, you know, outweigh any kind of evidence. And third, as I argued in 2007 and 2020, because religious experiences are had in each religion, and there are simpler non-divine explanations for religious experiences, religious experiences cannot justify religious belief in the first place. So they certainly can't justify it to outweigh evidence, but they really can't justify it at all. Right? Um, oops, I went too far, didn't I? There we go. Sorry about that. Another argument comes from theologians who suggest that demanding evidence for religious belief is naive because the nature of religious language is different and the nature of religious belief is different. The Gospels, for example, on this theory aren't literally true. They were constructed to confer truths about morality and the human condition. So they didn't really happen. They're just essentially mythical tales that confer ethical truths. Saying Jesus lives is like saying Frodo lives. Right? And you wouldn't demand evidence that Lord of the Rings is true, right? To believe that God exists on this theory is only to adopt certain attitudes, dispositions, and behaviors, not to literally think that some being exists. All right? Okay. But as I explained in 2015, 2020, A, and 2020, B, however, only a handful of academics employ this understanding. It does not describe how the vast majority of theists use religious language for what they believe. After all, it is one thing, uh, a little flashback here, it is one thing for a person to say that they still believe in Santa because they still believe in a spirit of generosity and kindness. They don't literally think that Santa exists, but I believe in Santa because I believe in generosity. Okay, I guess I'll let that slide. But if a person has to attenuate their belief in God so much where they'd have to admit, well, I don't really believe in God, I believe in a spirit of generosity or something like that, that person's just an atheist at that point, right? There are, and there are good reasons to think that they should just admit it. Here are those reasons. Irrational belief, especially in God, should be rejected. Above, I demonstrated that belief in God is irrational. Some, however, claim that it should be embraced anyway, perhaps even because it is irrational. So on Kierkegaard called this taking a leap of faith. But the idea that faith is virtuous is ludicrous. First, faith is often defined as belief without proof. But since proof of almost anything is impossible, a better definition is belief without reason. Now, a belief can be without reason by lacking evidence. But as I have shown, belief in God goes against the evidence, right? Like the evidence of evil. Why would anyone consider that virtuous, believing against the evidence? Why would that be virtuous? Do we consider flat earthers virtuous? Do we consider you know, vaccine deniers virtuous? No. Moreover, it is not virtuous to believe something without evidence either. Would you praise me if I decided for no reason to believe that a teapot orbits the sun? No evidence that that's true, but would that be virtuous to believe that without evidence? As I explained in 2011 and 2020, setting aside rare exceptions about the unprovable foundations of reasoning that we need to survive in the world, like modus ponens and modus tollens and induction and that kind of stuff, while the idea is a convenient way to goad people into believing that one thinks that they should, what, 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 I'm sorry, while the idea that faith is virtuous is a convenient way to goad people into believing what one thinks that they should believe, it is never actually virtuous to believe anything by faith. One has the legal right, okay, you have the legal right to believe what you want by faith, but neither the moral nor epistemic right to believe whatever one wants without reason exists. It can be legally permissible, but it is not morally permissible to just believe whatever the hell you want for no reason. And it's not epistemically permissible other, either. And epistemically, like you violate your epistemic duties. Epistemic means like your reasonable duties, your, your, your duties to be reasonable. Now, that said, I'm sorry, the moral nor epistemic right to believe whatever you want without reason exists. Now, sometimes belief by faith might be unavoidable. Good picture. William James argued that when remaining agnostic on an issue is equivalent to disbelief and what you decide will affect the direction of your life, you have a moral right to choose what you like. Okay, and all other things being equal, he might be right. But James was responding to William Clifford, 
who argue that it is always wrong everywhere for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. Now, while Clifford did not recognize that belief without evidence might sometimes be unavoidable, and so if it's unavoidable, it couldn't be morally wrong, right? His argument firmly established and was based in the fact that when it risks harm to others, belief without evidence is immoral. So the main point of Clifford's argument was that if you believe something without evidence and that belief can risk harm to others, then it's immoral to believe that thing without evidence. Right now, again, there might be unavoidable times when that's the case, but, but, but if it does risk harm to others, then it's immoral. The example he uses is a ship owner who could believe without evidence that like, is a ship seaworthy or not? And basically the ship owner says, well, uh, I could believe it's not and have it checked, but that would cost me a bunch of money. Right. Uh, or I could believe it is and just send it away. And if I believe it's seaworthy and it is, hey, I get the benefit of not having to pay for the inspection and the repairs and it makes a successful journey. I went either way. If it's not seaworthy and it sinks, I collect the insurance, no harm off my back. Right. And so I, I went either way. Right. And Clifford says, no, you're risking harm to others by that belief without evidence. So when you risk harm to others with, by believing without evidence, you're doing something wrong, especially when that risk to others is taken for your own benefit. The point here is, is there are very good reasons to think that belief in God, and comforting as it might be to you, risks harm to others. As I articulated in 2017, belief in God has been directly and indirectly responsible for numerous moral atrocities. Everything from the Crusades and the Inquisition to the actions of ISIS and the KKK. Indeed, nothing makes it easier to justify atrocities than the belief that they are commanded by or in defense of an infinitely perfect being. Let me, let me pause there really quick. Um, the idea here is that, right, like if you think what you are doing is in reply and in defense of and for the good of an infinite good, like God, you believe in God, you think what you're doing is in, in, is, is in, is in favor of an infinite good, then you can justify anything. Any finite evil can be justified because what, how, no matter how bad it is, it's not greater than infinity. And so you can wipe out entire races. You can do any of that and say, well, it's all for the glory of God. And God's bigger than that, right? God's infinite and that's finite, right? So does that make sense, right? And so this kind of idea that you can do something in, in favor of or in defense of an infinite God can allow one to justify basically any evil. That's not to say the belief in God hasn't also done some, some good, but the harms decidedly outweigh the benefits. As you've all know, Harari persuasively argued, from an ethical perspective, monotheism, was one of the worst ideas in human history. When one believes in God and thus promotes the belief, one raises the probability of such atrocities and thus risks harm to others. In fact, by voluntarily belonging to any group, one risks being at least partially responsible for that group's misbehavior, especially when group membership is determined by the belief which motivates the behavior. It's called guilt by association. So everyone who, so this is why, what was that guy's name? I forget, I'm, there, was, there was a case when a guy shot up an abortion clinic because he was convinced by all those fake videos that they were selling parts in, you know, back on the black market and all that kind of stuff, right? This was an idea that Ted Cruz himself had like promoted this idea that these videos were real. And that's really what Planned Parenthood would do and what we're doing and blah, 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 right? And then this guy goes and shoots up a bunch of people based on that false beliefs. Ted Cruz immediately said, no, he actually, he's a leftist extremist. Like he's trying to pin it on the other, because he realizes that although he didn't perform the, the shooting, by promoting the idea that motivated the shooting, he is guilty by association. Not as guilty as the person who did it, but he bears some guilt because he promoted the idea. Does that make sense? Right? And so in the same way, right? If somebody goes out and kills somebody in the name of God, and you believe in God, and you promoted the idea that God exists, you're sharing some culpability there, right? Um, let me elaborate on this for just a little bit more. Same thing applies with uh, biblical texts and like holy books. So for example, if somebody goes out and kills somebody in the name of like, and they, they say, well, I read this passage in the Bible and the Bible told me, I think the Bible says to do this and that's why I did it and yada yada, right? And they, and they go out and they justify it by referring to that holy book, right? If you believe that holy book, you're, you're gonna be partly responsible for that as well. Now, the person who believes in the holy book might say, yeah, but I don't interpret that passage that way. So I can't be held responsible. They misinterpreted the passage. That's not my fault. Okay, that means you don't bear as much responsibility, but here's the problem. 
you promote the idea that it, you should guide your you should guide your life based on a book that's open to interpretation. That itself is problematic. That opens up the problem. It's like, well, what if somebody interprets it wrong? Right? Is that making sense? Like, this is why I don't think that you should live your life according to Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings, right? But like, there's flaws in it, and it's open to interpretation. You could justify a lot of evil in the name of Lord of the Rings if you read it the wrong way or read it a way, right? A different way than I do, right? So if I promoted the idea that you should live your life according to Lord of the Rings and somebody goes out and quotes Lord of the Rings and does something evil, I'm partly responsible for that because I promoted the idea that you should. Does that make sense? Right? So, um, so called guilt by association. So everyone who believes in God bears at least some moral responsibility for crimes done in God's name. Of course, atheists such as Stalin and Pol Pot have also been responsible for their, for their fair share of atrocities. That is true. But their crimes were not motivated by their disbelief in God. That wasn't their motivation for doing them. In fact, they kind of invented their own religions that worship them as God, and that was part of the problem, right? What's more, since it is a knowledge claim, atheism is never a matter of faith. The atheist is simply proportioning their belief to the evidence, and it's never wrong to proportion your belief to the evidence. Additionally, contrary to popular opinion, atheism does not make one more likely to behave immorally. In fact, a less religious society is, we can actually like see the studies on this, is more stable and satisfy, and, and I'm, say, is, I'm sorry, in fact, the less religious a society is, the more stable and satisfying the lives of that society's inhabitants are. You can actually look at this scientifically and see that. So by promoting atheism, the atheist is reducing risk to others, right? Indeed, only an atheist can act without any suspicion that they may be rewarded or punished for it by some deity, right? So in other words, only an atheist can do something simply for the fact that it is good, and that's the only reason I'm doing it is because it's good. If you, if you got theism in there, there's always at least some possibility you're gonna be rewarded or punished for what you're doing, so it's always gonna be part of the motivation. Only the atheist can say, I'm not doing it for any other reason, then it's just the right thing to do. So perhaps only an atheist can do what is right purely for the reason that it is right, and thus, only atheists can engage in truly morally good actions. If so, only widespread atheism can truly make actions, moral actions, more common. Even so, uh, so even if, contrary to what I've demonstrated above, one could not know whether or not God exists, rejecting theism would still be epistemically and morally preferable. Now, some of the objections I have raised can be answered by redefinition. For example, a deity that is not all powerful enough to stop all evil, for example, can't be disproved by the existence of evil, okay? While such a move is not necessarily ad hoc because earlier theists' understandings of God lack perfection, there is still something, something deeply unsatisfying about such answers. But most of the arguments I have presented here own, not only also not only apply to like the traditional, traditional definition of God, but also apply to modified conceptions of deities. One should not believe in any deity unless the burden of proof is met, and for no deity has the burden of proof been met. So the arguments I have presented justify, beyond any reasonable doubt, the wider atheistic claim that no gods exist, not just God proper with the capital G and the, you know, the, 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 the Christian Muslim version, but also just no deities at all. But they undoubtedly, the arguments undoubtedly prove that God doesn't exist, that choosing to believe in God anyway is both unreasonable and immoral, so since I, as a rule, do my best, I'm not perfect, but I do my best to avoid immoral, unreasonable belief, that's why I'm an atheist. 